Well, welcome everybody to the 2021 Global Animals and Disaster Management Conference. I'm Mel Taylor. Um, our next session is entitled Injuries and Illness Risks for Responders to Animal Related Technical Rescue and Disaster Deployments, an international survey. And this is going to be presented by Chris Riley. Um, but you can see here that the presentation is in association with Steve DeGray uh, and the other members of the team there. We're very proud to, um, or very privileged, sorry, to have Chris with us today. And uh, if you're interested in Chris and Steve's um, bios and the uh, more details about this presentation, you can find that on our website under the speakers tab. Before we start, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping points. You'll see that the Zoom chat feature has been disabled for this session. Uh, if you have any questions, if you could please write those in the Q&A section. We'll get to those and put them to Chris at the end of the presentation. We'd like to encourage you to use the hashtag GADMConf um, on Twitter and any other social media. And at the end of this session, when you leave, there'll be a short evaluation form and we'd really appreciate your feedback. And just as a reminder, we are recording this session. We will be editing the videos and making them all available in July when we have a GADMAC awards ceremony um, to coincide with the release of the special edition of the Australian Journal of Emergency Management. So without further delay, Chris, I'd like to hand over to you and uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm really excited about having this opportunity with such a group of esteemed speakers. There's been some great presentations and I'm hoping that this uh, presentation makes a small contribution to our, our theme for the, this two weeks. Of course, we don't like to talk about these things, risks for responders. Um, we, we like to focus on animals, of course. However, it's a reality that we're in high risk environments and we need to pay attention to this. I'm luckily a member of the veterinary emergency response team here at Mass University and um, along with my colleague Steve DeGray and Steve DeGray is doing his master's in this area with me. We have Michelle McArthur who's a clinical psychologist, Hattie Squance who's a consultant in, in um, disaster, animal disaster um, management and Curly Thompson is a clinical anthropologist so we've got a multidisciplinary team here for sure. So we're motivated by the human animal bond, many of us are, um, but we also have motivation to preserve both human and animal life and the human life when we have a deployment comes before animal life. Um, we often focus and talk about animal welfare, but we need to also think about the welfare of the humans involved in the deployment or the rescue situation. Um, here at Massey, uh, VERT's roles are similar to others, uh, other groups. We have a technical emergency animal rescue role um, where we provide high levels of training and trained expertise to support safe um, animal extrication. But we also work with um, regional and the federal authorities in cases of disaster, declared disasters where um, animal rescues or animal welfare management is required. You'll see throughout this presentation images from my team and um, some of the responses we've been on. Um, and so just to give you context that we are an active group. Uh, so, you can see this video here, I'm hoping you can see that, and this is a rescue of a horse that fell down a gorge that was flooding, and you can see my team member Haley there struck in the head by a glancing blow from this horse, and I'm bent over there trying to sedate the horse on a long extension. And so here's a very dynamic uh, technical rescue in which um, Haley was struck in the head, and we'll talk a bit more about Haley momentarily. So you can see that slow motion again, the glancing blow, it doesn't look like much. All right, so um, this image on the right here, just this is Haley actually had uh, suffered a, a mild concussion and I saw blood from her helmet, but she didn't rise it at the time because she was so hyped up. It was only uh, myself and other team members noticed that she wasn't well, and then she went to a little bit of shock. So pretty important to have that PPE on. So we, we, we know these environments are very complex, very dynamic, and there's lots of risks there. Um, decisions, whether they're right or wrong, can result in an injury and illness, and the consequences of these decisions can be stress for the team members and injury. And these also extend to injuries and stress for the animals and the public, as well as the rescuers. Um, and a study we presented uh, in the US a couple of years ago We've, we found that actually physical injuries has a significant impact 
on the well-being mentally of a responder as well. So physical injuries are important, not just because of their own sake, but because of the mental health impacts they have as well. So we want to determine how um, being involved in these responses uh, uh, affects the responders in terms of their mental well-being, their relationships and social standing, uh, their financial situation, and this was mentioned yesterday by Rachel from Savings Talk, how financially people may be affected when they do rescues, and also physical well-being, which is going to be the focus of our talk today. We did also explore recovery strategies, but today we'll just focus on some of the recovery concerns that arose from this study. So just to give some more context, this is a report from a, uh, a newswire in the United States a couple of years ago where a man in Nevada died when he went to high surf to save his two dogs. Now this man was a former first responder, so he had training, but he nevertheless, he forgot that training. He raced in the water to save his dogs. He did so effectively, but got into trouble, was slammed in some rocks, and as a result, he died as a result of his injuries. So fortunately, um, I haven't been involved in rescue with this happened to a team member, but this is always in the back of our mind should be a concern, the welfare of our rescuers. And so we ran this study um, via a survey that we took about a year to design very carefully because it had significant um, risk of mental health impact just being involved in the survey itself. Uh, and it was a voluntary survey that sought demographic information from responders, um, information about what their roles they performed in the emergency um, responses and what kind of training experience they had. And we asked them to recall a memorable or recent event so they could recall a recent event that was positive or negative uh, or just any event they chose to. And this survey focused on questions around their well-being under the four categories we mentioned earlier. But as I said today, we're going to talk mostly about how this impacted them physically. A study of this type cannot be done without appropriate ethics approval. And we certainly sought um, a full human ethics approval before conducting our study. The study was, was pushed out um, through uh, friends and colleagues and experts in what we call a snowballing approach. So through the social networks, and that's how we got uh, people to participate because there's no formal worldwide structure that allows us to engage people working in um, animal disasters or uh, rescues. So firstly, uh, let's look at, look at this population of people that did respond. And they came from all over the world loosely, but you can see that they're mostly English speaking countries because that's where most of our contacts are. Um, in Canada, the United States, a large concentration, the United Kingdom and Australasia. And that's because most of the contacts I have are in those areas. And we had a few responses from South America and a few other jurisdictions, I think one from Madagascar even, around the world. Um, although there are 315 people who signed on, only 55, 55 only completed their demographic information, didn't tell us anything more about their roles or experiences. And as far as the well-being goes, the physical well-being, only 218 completed this section of questions. Um, the, the mix uh, in gender was about uh, two thirds female, a third male, which is consistent with a lot of survey type studies. Um, most people who look at the age were above the, uh, above the age of 40, 46 or 45, if you like. Um, a lot of people in this, this older range. And then the roles were mixed. Um, about half people or 40% of people were in volunteer roles. Um, 30% plus 16% makes up professional roles, both veterinary and emergency professionals. And then we had a small um, group of just animal or animal volunteers. We did some thematic analysis and, and we're not going to go and spend a lot of time on this, but just to see if the themes coming out from the text, free text responses were consistent with what we we're seeing in the numbers and indeed they were. The two most common terms that came up were animal and manager. And then we, if we look at the professional side, we see veterinarian, officer and fire addressing the professional responders. And then we see retired and volunteer, which tends to address the, the non-professional responders or the, the volunteers, whether they're trained or untrained. The background, so in animal rescue, if we look at these charts, and they're a little busy, so just bear with me, please. And um, blue refers to those people with expert or instructor level experience. 
or training. Um, the pink was the responder level, and then the light green is the interaction awareness level. And we see in the areas of human and animal first aid, a large number of people in responder level and fewer people in the expert instructor level. As we move towards through from there to other more specific skills and TILA, or technical large animal emergency rescue or pet rescue, we see you have fewer instructors and fewer at the responder level. And then we get to uh, wildlife rescue or marine rescue, which are quite specialized forms of animal response. We see even fewer people with training or background there. Remembering that the yellow representing uh, no training and the, the purplish colors means they had, um, it wasn't a relevant question for that person. If we look at disaster response, we see in disaster management, disaster communications, stress mitigation, so mental health, if you like, uh, military response. We mentioned we put in military response because we do realize a lot of people in the professional space have a military background or even volunteers. And we see relatively few people in this area, the disaster response area, that have expert or instructor status. And indeed, many of these people are forced into leadership or management roles, even though they have this expertise, where we have um, uh, more people in the responder or technician level for communication and disaster management uh, areas there. So we can see that perhaps fewer people with higher levels of training in disaster response. So what about the incident that they recounted? So this is a picture of Haley at the Christchurch earthquake where they supported the search and rescue dogs there. And this is one of Vert's first responses. So, so we ran the survey at the beginning of 2019, and you can see that most of the responses, the incidents described were in, in, the, in the previous three years or so. So the recency is very important for effects of recall um, and to reduce recall bias, but it's still nevertheless a problem when you run any survey. Um, over half the people recalled their most recent incident. And interestingly, when we look at most memorable positive experience, Many more people recalled a most memorable positive experience compared to a negative experience, which is quite interesting because some of the feedback we got indirectly was that people thought this would bias towards the negative, and that's not the case. Um, some people didn't tell us what kind of experience they recalled, about 3%, and some talked about some other experience they want to relate to us. The insert types are broad, and that's really great because that means that this we're really getting good representation of different responders across the world. However, when it comes to statistics, of course, this decreased statistical power because the range of skills and responses that we've covered is quite broad and hard to get an average idea of what's happening. But nevertheless, we see that almost a half of responders um, were responding about an animal entrapment or misadventure that they'd um, been involved in the rescue thereof. Uh, wildfires, you see what number, high number of wildfires. We can think about the survey period. This is consistent with the high number of wildfires in Australia and in California that year and before. Um, floods, hurricanes, um, marine strandings, even a volcanic eruption, which surprised me a little bit. But, so we've got a, a broad range of different types of responses, uh, whether they be rescue or disaster. Um, in terms of scale, um, there's quite a variation um, go, most of them were local, which we consisted from the large animal technical rescues, um, where fewer were national level responses. And this is quite different because you see many studies in this space where they, they have uh, follow up on national scale disasters. So this one covered a quite a breadth of different scales of disasters. And then in terms of trauma, just to give a little bit more context to the people here, over half the events people described involved in animal death and three quarters of an animal injury. So certainly for the animals, it's a high risk situation. But we were quite shocked that 20% of incidents involved a human death and about a similar number of human injury. And then 14% um, of people reported that, that they were at an event where a team member was injured. So how did this affect our responders? So, this, um, this graph shows you um, the level of or the percentage of people that experience a mental, emotional compromise and physical compromise. And so just to show you comparison, 
Um, fewer people have physical compromise and the mental health issues. And so that, as I said, that's another presentation we've given another time. But just to give you an idea that nearly 20% thought that their physical health or ability was compromised in some way. Um, most, about 80% thought this they were affected in a mild way, 14% moderately, and but 4% markedly were affected. So this is what they thought. And then we confirmed the validity of this by asking questions in a slightly different way. And from that, we got that 18.3% of people reported some kind of injury or illness in this survey. So in terms of gender mix, 30% male, 70% female, which is totally consistent with our response groups, predominantly being female and male. There was no real difference, significant difference in whether you're a trained volunteer professional and your risk of injury or illness. Um, about 15% of people suffered an injury and then 3% injury and an illness together. And then about 1% suffered an illness. So if we look at that number, is that something that we as, as rescue and response agencies happy with? And I, I suggest maybe not. Um, of the people that described their injuries, um, they involved many different bodily regions. Most involved the hands, about 45% had some kind of hand injury. Um, arms and legs were commonly injured places. It's of concern if we look at the lateral view or side view here, 13% of people reported a foot injury, and we know that we should be wearing foot PPE. And although only 5% of people got a head injury, the consequence of head injury is certainly a grave concern. 21% of people have a back injury and 11% a pelvic injury. So um, certainly a, a distribution of injuries that we can think about on how we might moderate those. In terms of illnesses, the most common illness people reported was a respiratory infection. And some people said that it was being in close quarters and close confinement with team members that were sick that caused that. And others got lacerations or wounds that later became infected. Um, this might be a bit of an ooh picture, a nasty um, rope burn here. Uh, lacerations and cuts or wounds were com most common type of injury followed by bruising. And we think about, uh, we'll show you next slide about what caused some of these injuries. Bruising and general soft tissue is a common injury when you have interaction with a large animal. Muscle and tendon injuries, dislocations, strains or sprains, they speak to unusual mechanical environments or working environments. And we already spoke briefly about concussion or brain injury. So we asked people what contributed to your injury illness, and by far, most people said it was the, the injury cause was caused by the animal rescued itself. And we'll, we'll talk about what that might mean. So that correlates with the high number of respondents who reported being involved in an animal rescue. Then we had some things that happened during the events, miscommunication, equipment failure, um, action or inactions of others. So these were concerns. And then we had things that should really be addressed by our preparation and training, equipment failure, um, lack of training or maintenance uh, of qualifications, failure to wear PPE. So it's both operational and preparation type issues as responders. I did some linear aggression uh, on all the different variables, and I'm not gonna mention all the ones I looked at, but what factors were statistically associated with um, risk of injury or illness? And the number of rescues was increased your odds uh, significantly. So what that means is that with every incident you attend, there's a 2% increase in your risk of being injured. So meaning that by the time you've attended 50, 50 events or response uh, deployments, that means that you would have a 100% chance of having sustained injury or illness in that time. And we looked at different types of pet ownership. So we had no pets, which is none. Uh, we had horses and livestock, companion animals, and companion animals in my life. And if you had not owned a pet, your odds of being injured are five-fold greater. Uh, so that's quite an interesting finding as well. So what a little bit, a little bit about recovery and resilience. So the median time for recovery from injury illness was four weeks and our range two days to two plus years. Um, two people reported they had unresolved injuries. Um, one, one person reported long-term facial disfigurement and another person an orthopedic injury that was ongoing and chronic and disabling. Uh, one person also had a finger, which obviously fingers don't grow back, lost a finger. Um, just to give an example of some of the treatments, so were people that needed surgery, 
um, both orthopedic and plastic, physical therapy and chiropractic treatments for some people. Um, one person had chemical burns to the eyes due to um, contaminant in the water they were working in, required eye treatment. But most people were caught, relied upon self-care and rest. What were our impediments to recovery? Um, and a lot of these were, this is where qualitative information is pretty important for reflection, uh, not just the numbers. What inspired me to do this study was in 2017, I was at a, a large technical um, animal rescue conference in California put on by BARTA and uh, University of California, Davis. And I met a couple of young, young women who were fresh from the California fires. And I could see they were stressed by some of the things they experienced. And I asked them about what kind of support they had from their family, uh, from their organizations, and they had none. And it really concerned me and caused me a bit of distress as well. And so that's what really motivated this study. So in, in the current study, we see that lack of support from colleagues and team is an impediment to recovery. A lack of the organization responding to the incident in an appropriate way. Um, a lack of PPE provision, both during the incident and then afterwards if they're asked to go to another event and they've got an injury that's not protected. Uh, something that Rachel mentioned yesterday was the cost. Um, people had to be away from their practice to respond, um, the save them vets had to respond. And so th that means you go out in your response, you exhaust, you come back and you have to go back to work. So there's not enough time to recover. And then often when you go away and do a good deed, you, you face punishment for that and that is all that work that you couldn't do because you're away from your job is building up and you come back and there's a huge workload to overcome when you get back there. And as I mentioned, some people have a temporary or permanent disability. So, so clearly, um, we, this verifies what we really intrinsically know that if we're involved in this activity of uh, animal rescue and disaster response, there is a risk to our physical well-being and much of our training is directed against that. But nevertheless, it doesn't prevent risk because we can't eliminate exposure risk. So we can reduce perhaps, but not eliminate the risk. And then every time we have a situation, as, as Rachel uh, Saven's presentation yesterday just said quite correctly, we plan, we plan, we plan, but then every situation is unique. The people are unique, the how decisions that might need to be made are unique. And so that's a challenging thing to overcome. Um, is animal ownership proxy for the experience of responders with normal animal behavior because not only do you need to be able to recognize normal behavior, but to appreciate that when animals are under stress in disasters or rescue, they do not behave. They don't behave predictably, but not normally. So they re often react in a very dangerous way. And we can talk about behavior, but unless you're interacting with behavior and physically, it's very hard to learn and understand these things. And so there's some element of experiential training with animals required to learn these behaviours. Um, that's my belief as, a, as a, uh, a veterinary educator. All right, so just to put this in a Kiwi context, um, you know, preparation and training, bro. So we meet these issues that were raised, we understand can be addressed by more careful preparation of teams um, and training, and then how we operate in the field. And so when we look at our our situation here, uh, how we operate in the field, we um, operate under uh, civil defence emergency management operations, similar to AIMS or any civil defence management uh, structure uh, here. So that's how we should be responding. It's a professional response. Um, Organisations need to conduct post-event debriefs, assessments and reassessments of their tools and strategies. And we need to also think about how we're providing for the training and support of the mental and physical well-being of our team members before the activities, during the, the responses, and then after them. And, and then reflecting on this, uh, go through this cycle of response, recovery, prepare, so that we can continue to do our jobs and perform our roles effectively. So in closing, I'd just like to acknowledge, um, in addition to my co-researchers, um, these many opinion leaders who helped distribute our survey in the USA um, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Canada, United Kingdom. I'm sure you recognise many of these speakers, uh, many of these um, collaborators, or if you like, or who, who helped us to do a survey because they indeed they're presenting at our conference here. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Chris, for an amazing presentation and a really important issue again. Um, I think I was struck, uh, oh, sorry, bad pun, um, by the uh, the video of Haley being kicked in the head, you know, a combination of, of just obviously how powerful animals like horses are, especially when they're, you know, in that fight or flight situation. Um, but also, you know, when you've got re responders standing in water in that constant context. So the idea of having someone hit hard in the head, falling down in, in water and then having to deal with both an injured person and a, and a flailing horse would be really quite a, a tough situation to be in. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in and please, if you have any more questions, please um, put those in the Q&A and I'll ask those to Chris. Um, I think Jennifer's here is asking for a little bit of um, clarification around the male and female respondents. I, I think, think you gave the proportion of each. So I think we've got a bit of an idea of that and the overall number, but um, yeah. She was wondering the extent to which that different representation in the types of injuries might have been um, related to the genders of those respondents. Yeah, so we can say that overall there was not a gender association with the risk of injury. In terms of the injury types, we just don't know, have enough data to explore that issue more deeply. It's just a matter of statistical power, really. Um, so it's, it's got to be very careful in making assumptions or assertions that are around gender without more data. And I'm, I'm very, I work with a lot of women and have to have a respectful environment and not make assumptions based on gender. So, um, so I can't really comment much more on that. I think we all need to have training. We all need to be responsible and, and operate safely. And gender shouldn't be the, we shouldn't have gender specific training. It should be, we all need to work safely and operate safely. Um. So Julie's got a couple of, uh, actually she's got a comment for you. So firstly, I'll just read this, um, yeah, more of a personal comment, but she says your concern in 2017 made a great difference to her directly and she thanks you for your research. Um, but then goes on to ask a, a, another question, which is, um, she says one metric not re referenced is the emotional effects of respondents' inability to deploy um, uh, uh, sorry, I just sorry, my, not, my questions just jumped. Um, it, their, their inability to access animals in areas where that are in need, where they're in need. Um, and Rachel touched on that briefly yesterday, I think, as well. So, have you got any comments about that sort of emotional, mental injury? Yeah. So we gave a presentation, and we have a much larger analysis of the emotional and um, mental well-being cost of this. And. It, I'm very empathetic about those those situations. Even as a veterinarian, we often can help, but we have to euthanize. So it's, it is an emotional cost. I'm not sure. What we found is that recovery from emotional distress and mental well-being is a very individual thing. And there's usually people employ multiple strategies to do this. And it's, if I can credit now, it's, it's a matter of replenishing the well. And part of that replenishing is sharing the burden of um, having people that will listen and try to understand and be empathetic. And sometimes our organizations are so busy doing and operating uh, professionally that we forget those qualities that are important to keep us sustained. Um, and the mental health issue is really coming up in a few more of the questions. Um, I hope you don't mind answering those, but no. um, Bridget asked a great question. I say this as a psychologist as well. Should psychologists be included in an animal disaster response team? I do think um, we need a wealth of different range of expertise and having someone with some um, support skills, uh, whether they're a nurse trained in this area, a psychologist, um, but it also has to be someone that's credible. So what I, what I mean by that is that if you're a team member and psychologist, that's different from being an outside person. And so if you're coming on as that's your role in our team is to provide that well-being and support for our team members, then I think that's totally appropriate. If you're outside the team, there may be people that are unable to take advantage of that. In fact, in our survey of the mental well-being, we got some evidence of pushback on that as a, a resource. Um, it wasn't a resource that people used very well. So I do think when we think of our technical skills, it's important to have people in our team whose job is to take care of the humans in our team. Yeah, definitely. And I think that peer-to-peer -peer support has been really effective in other emergency services um, in terms of looking out for the mental health of the broader team, but doing it from, from within. Um, uh, Michelle, here asked, uh, sorry, Michelle here asked a great question about um, 
uh, your study and says, are you aware of any countries providing post-deployment medicals and mental health assessment for all responders following disaster response? Not in the, not in this space, the animal welfare space. Um, uh, certainly in the UK, in the, um, in the fire service there, they have this kind of thing, instruction, these structures in place. Some, often you hear about a disaster and they have this emergency, people go in, provide mental health and wellbeing support in the short term. But if we're going to do that, I'd like to see, see them in part of the planning phase as well as the, the post event phase. And, and we know that it's great to have people at the time, but it's afterwards and the long term impacts and ongoing impacts um, that, are, that can be really dis disabling in, in the improvement of people's status as they recover. So, so no, I don't know of any particular focused on that people who are doing the animal welfare, but others may be aware. No, indeed. Um, Heidi makes a, a really interesting point here, and I was wondering about this as well a bit. So, um, firstly, she congratulates you on your presentation, but says, as an animal owner and lover, it's common to rush in to help a distressed animal without much thought to personal safety. A good reminder that we need to take a deep breath and assess any potential dangers to ourselves before we rush in. I know I'm guilty of this. And again, I, I know I've come across these sorts of um, comments as well in research around, um, you know, the rescuers having to manage the animal, but also manage the owner who is really, you know, obviously desperate and, and very bonded to the animal in question. Uh, do, do you think um, from your, maybe from the qualitative data, did you get any evidence that, that the owners themselves were, were somehow, you know, endangering the team at all? Um, no, we didn't get that sense from the qualitative responses. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, in the case of disaster, there's a lot more control over people um, who has access to the site. When it comes to an individual animal rescue, that can be more challenging. And, and you know, our, our mantra is my safety, my team's safety, the public's safety, the animal's safety. And we just try and explain that to the people. Some, in some cases, we get assistance from other people that maybe um, the police or someone else to remove a person who's put themselves in danger. And I, and I just, I mean, personally, I just tell them, until you're safe, I can't make your animal safe. And so it, it is difficult and challenging. I think we have to be able to say to the people openly, like, we can't help you if you're not, if you're in danger. It's still difficult. We still go to rescues where where the police have allowed the client to, or the owner to go in uh, without PPE and, and get involved in the rescue. And we still struggle with that. So I'm not sure there's a great solution, but, but I think just caring about people as well as animals is pretty important and relating that concern to them can help reassure them that you're there for both them and their animal. That's a good point. Um, we have one last question here. And, and this, this time the, um, the attendees asking, what are the ways that we can work towards preventing this level of injury? So, so what can we actually do to improve the situation, do you think? We are doing a lot already. Um, when we have standardised training and recognised training modules, uh, when we operate under emergency management systems that require reflection analysis reporting, when we get engaged in proper, properly structured organisations, we decrease risk. We also need to um, be able to say to my team manager, look, you're tired, you need to swap over and get another manager in, or um, we need to be, we need to have that kind of honesty without feeling that we're being judged. And when we were at the fires in Nelson uh, a couple of years ago, um, I was in the EOC, the Incident Command Centre, and I could see people there that need to be relieved. They were not coping anymore. So we need to have, um, we need to be responsible not only in making sure we have good training, but how we operate um, is really critical as well in the field when we do these responses. The reality is sometimes that the whole scale of things is so overwhelming, we're just doing what we can. And there's always going to be risk. We're not going to eliminate that. But we need to think about what we can reduce for risk. So um, this week I had a medical procedure, and so I took myself off the rescue team because I don't want to increase my risk of injury or put the team at risk. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Chris. I think we've come towards the end of the, um, the questions. Um, 
I just wanted to um, thank you for your uh, for your presentation and for the rest of the team for their input as well. Um, and our next presentation is going to be in one and a half hours. That's with Ian Dacre, looking at livestock emergency um, preparedness in the Asia and Pacific area. So please join us again in about an hour and a half. We we'll look forward to seeing you back here. Thank you, Grace.